Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization, and I want to ask you a question. How long is the perfect program? In other words, how long, including your accumulation phase, several weeks of making your training harder over time, plus the deload, that in total, the mesocycle length, how long should that be to give you your best results? Let's dive in nerd style. So program is a mesocycle, accumulation week plus deload. First, and, and just, just to put this in context of where we're rough timelines so you can play around with ideas in your head, it's like three to four all the way up to seven or eight weeks. Like imagine you know, five weeks of harder training, one week of deload, that's six weeks total. We're talking about that range. But that's a big range, three weeks all the way to nine weeks maybe. That's a, a hell of a lot of difference. That's actually you know, a multiple of three. Where in there is the perfect program? Well, let's set up a couple of ideas. And the first thing, as I often do or try to do intellectually, is when you have to answer a question that seems a little nebulous, try to break that question down intellectually by reminding yourself what the goal of training is. Right? Don't just think, oh, what's the perfect mesocycle? What's all the, what, what sort of stuff are we trying to accomplish in training? And I can think of at least three things. First, you want to make sure that your training mesocycle starts easy enough to not overreach you at the start. If you start your training mesocycle close to your maximum recoverable volume, the most volume you can recover for in one week, and go all sets completely to failure, like not Dorian Yates, low volume, high intensity, not Kevin Lavrone, high volume, lower intensity, both high volume, high intensity. If you do that, you'll be training for like a week and a half. You'll be like Mr. Potato Head, your arm will fall off, and then you'll deload for another week. And that's a kind of a weird way to train. It doesn't seem optimal. So first, you want to start your mesocycle a little bit easy. At least lower on the volume, maybe lower on the relative effort, at least some combination of both. Next goal, in order to get good results. You can't just stay easy. That's ridiculous. You would never get jacked. So goal number two is to progress from week to week to week so that every workout is an overload from the last one. It's got to be challenging. It has to be challenging, but we don't want to progress so fast that we just skyrocket the fatigue. So if you did 10 reps with 100 pounds last week, this week maybe it's 11 reps with 105 pounds. But you don't want to be like, man, I feel great. You do 15 reps with 130, your pec comes off the bone, and you're like, oh, that was that. So there is a fine line to play there with balancing to make things harder than last time. How's that, Coach Reg? Yeah, I know. In any case, we all have an inner Coach Greg comes out every now and again. Harder than last time, but not so hard that it's like the end of the world and you can't progress any further. Lastly, ideally, before your mesocycle ends in that last accumulation week, you want to come pretty close to hitting two theoretical ideas. One is to have about zero reps in reserve. So take every set to failure or really, really close. Because you have to beg the question, if you're still progressing in load and reps and you end your mesocycle potentially having been able to go even further beyond, why did you stop? Like your last week should be pretty fucking hard. Almost all of the training you'll see on our channel on Mondays when we put up our training is last week's or simulated last week's of training. When any people that come on the channel, we're like, hey, this is a peak week style. Like, that's what it should look like. So your goal at the end of a training program should be go hard. If you set up your progression in such a way that you're like, oh, time to deload, and someone's like, could you have worked harder this last week? You're like, yeah, absolutely. I got in a couple more weeks than me. It begs the question of why are you dealer? The second thing you want to do is get pretty close to your maximum recoverable volume. Intellectually, this makes a lot of sense just on theory. Like if you could have recovered from more training volume, which you could have almost certainly benefited from hypertrophy-wise, you got another week of deload after that to relax and recover and bring fatigue down. Why didn't you at least get close to your maximum recovery volume? If someone's like, hey, like how many sets of back are you doing this last week of your training? You're like, eight. Oh, wow. How many can you recover from? You're like, 16. Okay. It's like, uh, why don't you just do like at least 12 today so that your body can be challenged and recover and grow during deload? You're like, eh, I don't want to work that hard. That's how I train. I'm a lazy piece of shit. You don't want to train like me though. You want effective stuff. So essentially we're asking three things. We want our meso to start early enough so that it, uh, sorry, when, when, <laughs> when our meso starts, we want to start easy. So we have room to progress. We want to be able to progress and we want to be able to end at our limits at pretty close to failure with most of the sets and also very close to our maximum recovery volume such that our performance in that 
last week of training can't be replicated. If someone canceled your deload and said, can you make even more PRs next week? You should come in the gym next week and be like, nope, not happening. That's how you know your training is really good. So translated into more mathematical terms, we want to start our meso at three RIR and MEV, minimum effective volume. The mesocycle should end at around zero RIR and close to MRV. And the next question is, how do we progress from the easy three RIR at MEV over the weeks to zero RIR and MRV? How fast do we want to get there? Because that really does determine the length of our program in a really large sense. Now, there are at least three options. These aren't the only three options, but they paint the ends of a spectrum. Through the spectrum is all kinds of options as to how fast to progress, how aggressively to progress week to week to week, be it reps, be it load, be it sets. I'm going to give you guys three ends of a spectrum, a very conservative end, an intermediate end, and a very aggressive end. And we'll talk about which one of these has its uh, trade-offs, uh, upsides and downsides. Okay, so first, the slower method. If you progress with this method, you're going to be able to train for longer before you need to deload. And it's going to take you longer to deserve a deload, so to speak. Like you're not going to be really fatigued until maybe six or seven weeks or eight weeks in doing this. What is this? First, you hold your reps in reserve the same every other week. Week one, three reps in reserve. Week two, three reps in reserve. Week three, two reps in reserve. Week four, two reps in reserve again. And one for two weeks and zero and so on. Like technically, if you make it to zero reps in reserve for two weeks straight somehow, that's an eight-week accumulation. That's a nine-week mesocycle. Wow, holy crap. And you only add a set when it's ultra compelling to do so. Like if you're getting remotely decent pumps, remotely good soreness, anything, you just keep the volume the same. You only add a set here and there to whichever exercise or muscle group is like, we're just really honestly just not doing anything. Like you do two sets of bicep curls and someone's like, do you feel anything? And you're like, bro, I need like six sets at this point to feel fucking anything. And I was like, okay, okay, fine. Go to three sets. Very conservative, very conservative. Next, the moderate approach. In the moderate approach, Sorry, by the way, real quick, I have to mention, how do you progress in RIR? You don't actually do that. You have to adjust your reps and your load to do so. So if it's three RIR last week, three RIR again this week, you might be able to add like five pounds to a few lifts, two and a half to some others. You might be able to squeeze in an extra rep, but a lot of times you'll just repeat the same week, same goal. Last time I benched 100 for sets of 10, this time I bench 100 for sets of 10. It's still an overload because it's close enough to your window of adaptation, uh, to your limits of ability, that it will stimulate some muscle growth, but conservative amount. So notice, in an accumulation in which we go slow, each week doesn't cause a lot of muscle growth stimulus, but there are tons of sequential weeks which cause muscle growth stimulus added up in a row. And the later weeks absolutely start to cause a ton of stimulus because, gee whiz, you know, they're actually pretty hard. Moderate approach is you reduce RIR by one each week, four, three, two, one, zero. Sorry, three, two, one, zero. <laughs> Good God, starting at 10 RIR, that's how I train. Unless you can add one rep or five pounds to an exercise from last time and still match the other side of that. So let's say you did sets of 10 with 100 pounds. That was three RIR. You go and you do sets of 11 with 100 pounds. If that's still three RIR as you perceive it, you take it. Don't go any harder. If you do 105 pounds for sets of 10 and you actually ma manage to make that performance and that's actually feeling like th three RIR again, totally cool. But if it feels like two, no big deal because the progression is part of the point. So if we can take easy progress and not have to reduce RIR, we take it. As you guys can tell, some weeks you're going to be able to do that. Some weeks you can't. Some weeks of accumulated fatigue rises more. Some weeks it doesn't. And then this mesocycle style ends up being something that will lead us to about six weeks until we have to hit zero RIR and the fatigue really starts to creep up. And to that end, on the sets stuff for this moderate approach, we add a set when autoregulation via pump, soreness, et cetera, tells you to do so in, in, a, in a very middle of the road manner. Not a bad way to go. Lastly is the faster approach, the aggressive approach, the most aggressive of these. First, your goal is to reduce RIR by one every week, even if that means adding a lot more 
reps or a lot more load to the next set. So for example, you've done leg press, 300 pounds for sets of 10. Next next week you come in, your warm-ups feel fucking easy, bro. Your first set, you hit 305 pounds. You think it's going to be for a set of 10. You get to 10 and you're like, I'm at like infinity RIR. So you end up doing like 12. You added two reps. And the next set, you're like, dude, that still wasn't that hard. I'm going to go up to 310 or even 315 and then hit some more sets of 10 or some more sets of 12. So in this progression, you have to follow RIR. Every is RIR. Three, two, one, zero. And if between two and one, it takes you to add 20 pounds and two reps to every set in order to really go from two to one RIR because you're adapting so fast, shit, go to town. Go to town. Whatever it takes, stick to those RIRs as fast as possible progression there. And this is, again, interesting move, but your auto-regulation for set addition, how to decide if you need more volume, is basically like you add a set when you remotely suspect that you could recover from it. You're like, oh, I think I can recover from this for next week. Add it. And if you really feel like you're under training, sometimes you add two sets. So you can go from bent rowing for three sets and then pull downs for four to bent rowing for five sets the next week and pull downs for six if it really was just super under training you. Okay, very aggressive. So what sets these things apart is really three things, how they handle three variables. One is the load progression. You can go from adding the same load, there's zero load added every week, same load, but better technique or whatever. Adding two and a half pounds, five pounds, 10 pounds, or 15 plus pounds to the bar every single time. And, and higher if you need. Adding reps, you could just try the same reps on a very conservative approach, or adding one rep, two reps, or two plus. And of course, adding sets, where one is you don't add, you basically by default add zero sets, and it's really compelled to do so. Telling yourself, I'm only adding one set at a time per muscle group per week, or going two and more sets. That's what determines how aggressive your progression is. Now, here's the thing. The big revelation and if we try a bunch of those different progressions and see which one happens, is that first of all, any individual that is training can just choose to progress with one of those or another of those. It's a choice that you make, which gives you some wiggle room. And your genetics and or environment and or training history will let you know if there's upper or lower bounds on that. For example, for some people, Progressing too slow is just like a massive opportunity wasted to grow. You're like, this training is too easy. Nothing is happening. This is stupid. Whereas for other people, going really, really fast just completely beats them up and leads to skyrocketing fatigue. And they're like, I'm just outpacing myself. It's like trying to run on a treadmill when the treadmill is geared to beyond your top speed. Like you're going to, you're going to fall off the thing sooner or later. So the question comes back up, it's the central question of this video, what is better, going slower or going faster? Well, hold on a sec. Some more insights. If you go a little slower, your progress is slower, but your training quality, each set, the technique, the imposition of fatigue systemically not being there so you can really feel all the fibers, that is higher. And your fatigue accumulation is lower and slower, so you can train steadily for longer and see more momentum and progress. And also, at any given time through the program, your risk of injury is notably, though by a small margin, lower. Interesting. If you go more aggressively, you do make faster gains, faster progress. But for a shorter time, it doesn't last as long. That's for you, that's for you nighttime, sexy time in the bed champions out there. Your boy's going at it for 27 seconds. Are you feeling that? Bitch, you're going to remember every 27 seconds of that shit. That's like a tornado. They used to call me in high school, the tornado. Nobody ever spoke to me in high school. In any case, you don't get as long of a run because the fatigue really bunches up really fast. The injury risk is a little bit elevated. So all that stuff has to be taken in consideration. The result of all of this, and I know this is going to sound clickbaity as fuck, so I'm sorry, but I promise I'll have more insight in addition to that. Mesocycles of anywhere from about four weeks long, a three to one paradigm, three accumulation, one deload, all the way to about eight weeks, which is a seven to one paradigm, seven accumulation, one week deload, generate roughly the same outcome. And the debate about which one is better is nuanced and more individually based than it is generally. I get a lot of questions like, hey, I'm running a four to one split, like, or sorry, four to one paradigm, is that okay? Or five to one or six to one or whatever. 
And I'm never in a situation or hardly ever where I'm like, well, no, no, that's just stupid. Don't do that. There are more individual stuff has to be taken into account. A couple other thoughts. First, you could say, okay, hold on a sec. If I train for three weeks and then take one week of deload, I don't really grow much in that deload week or at least don't stimulate a lot of growth. A seven to one is like, if you run that through a whole training year, you're deloading double the time. Like two times the amount of essentially not stimulating growth. Yes. However, if you get a whole week of resensitization every four weeks, your muscles are always a bit more sensitive to growth and that training quality within those three weeks is high. Let me paint another picture for you. If you train for six weeks on end, week six might be like, yeah, you're technically progressing, but you're so exhausted. It might've been better for you just to deload and have another high quality five weeks instead of going out to six. What do you get when PhD sports scientists collaborate with pro bodybuilders? The most effective muscle growth training app ever made. Get yours now. In the end, between about 48 weeks, the accumu accumulation to deload paradigm probably auto cancels because the shorter paradigms don't give you as much chance to stimulate, but the quality of the stimulus might be better. So it cancels out to really have uh, a lot of general equivalence. However, here's where the real meat and potatoes is. Some people will have limits and what is needed for them may be different than what it is for others. If you are a beginner and I put you on a three to one paradigm, you're going to be deloading when you have like zero fatigue. And you're going to be like, this is just like a missed opportunity to grow this week. I would have to say yes. For beginners and people that heal really fast, oftentimes females, the three to one paradigm, gee, in many cases, it's just objectively suboptimal. You could have trained for longer. It's like, a, imagine going to the club with your friends and like everyone's at peak club hour having fun. And you've been there for like an hour and a half and the club doesn't close for another hour and a half and everyone's like just, just coming up. I don't mean on Molly, but also Molly. And it's just like at that time where you're like, yes. Like it's fucking weird when one of your friends is like, all right guys, like let's get out and go to the diner that we always go to after the club together. And you're like, ah, yeah, the diner's fun. But like, we're just getting into the shit. We could just still be here longer and then go to the diner later. Similar, if you're a beginner or someone who heals fast, a deload week when you don't need it is some shit that you get when you don't need. It's like, no thanks. On the other hand, for the slow healing, especially for the very advanced, huge, enormous muscular people that are towards the end of their training careers, older in age chronologically, for example, they're not making it to seven to one. If they started a paradigm that they were trying to get seven consecutive weeks of hard training, the first week would have to be like six RIR and like below their minimum effective volume, which is to say a maintenance week. Why? Why would you do a week of maintenance unless it's a maintenance phase? If they train at their MEV, minimum effective volume or above in the first week, just at their MEV and just at three reps in reserve, their progressions all the way to zero reps in reserve and MRV is only gonna take like three or four weeks. Just the minimum progression, their conservative end, when we talked about those three, the, the slower, moderate, and faster progressions, their slower progression will take four or five weeks. Their average will take three or four. And their fast, they can't even do fast because it would be two to one. So for those people, seven is completely out of the question. So as you can tell, if you're a beginner, if you heal fast, you can train for longer before deloading. If you are advanced, and you heal slow, you need you cannot train as long before you deal. You need to deal it sooner. For everyone else, the trade-offs in between are pretty even. Somewhere between four to eight weeks works well for everyone else. In order to make sure you're doing the program that's the right length for you, you have to get in the trenches, which you're already in, lob a grenade over, put on your World War I gas mask, and try for yourself to modulate the accumulation and deload paradigm by one week at a time to see what happens. Try, you, let's say you normally do four to one paradigms, four weeks of accumulation and one week of deload. Try a five to one, see how it goes. Try it two times in a row. Try a three to one, see how it goes. How's your training quality? How's your progression? How's your muscularity over time? And you can modulate these variables as long as you hit the following check marks 
in every program you write and that you do, or almost every one. First, you start around three reps in reserve, at least. You start around your minimum effective volume, something that gives you a disruption, a pump, a bit of fatigue, nothing too easy. You have to progress in load and reps in some way on most, if not all weeks. Doing the same week back to back too many times in a program strains the imagination. If you have a clear sign that you are under training, you have to reduce the volume or not progress it at least. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Good God, I said that backwards. If you have a sign that you're under training, that you're not doing enough, then you have to make sure that you add a little bit of volume. You can't be doing like two sets of leg curls or whatever, and someone's like, sore, no, pump, no, feel anything in your hamstrings, eh. Okay, that's not how gains are made. On the other hand, if there are clear signs of you overreaching and recovery is barely occurring, don't add volume. Do not progress any further on volume because you will add so much, you won't be able to recover and you'll have to take a deload. If you take these constructive elements into your program, you can play around with faster and slower paradigms within that constraint, see which one you like best. What's going to happen is your body will find a paradigm that it likes the best for you. If you listen to your body well enough, recovery, performance, physique, rep strength, after a while, you'll be like, you know, man, I have my best training at a four to one paradigm or three to one or six to one. And over time, it can even change. I used to be able to run five to ones. Then I got bigger and stronger and older. Ugh. And now I'm good with four to ones and even three to ones are back. Really, really good for me. Your stuff will change. It'll be different. Over the course of your career, it'll probably decline somewhat. But that just means you're being smart, getting as much as you can out of your system and getting the best results possible. Folks, if you like nerdy stuff like this, we have a members section in which for just a little bit more money through YouTube every month, you get extra videos that are almost always nerdier than the videos you will see here, more in-depth sports science-y type stuff. Give that a thought. If you have questions for me personally, you want to get into a great community and get a bunch of training programs so you can be well on your way, the Team Forum Forum is something that we do. We got, geez, we got uh, a thousand members nowadays. That's pretty sweet. What's up, members? Hey, hey, Team Forum, say something in the comments. You know what I'm saying? Rep, rep the set or whatever. Squad up. Nah, 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 nah. Anyway, I'll uh, get into gangster rap next time.